All right. Uh, happy Wednesday. Uh, we are going to kick off the third installment of our technique talk uh, with a dolphin kick and breaststroke pull out underwater session. Bro, I don't know. Can you look for me, please? Let's remind let's remind everyone before we get going on this that you needed to be you need to be muted. Um, the you coaches are going to be talking. We will take time for questions, but please make sure you are muted. Okay, so as we have done in all of our sessions, we are going to start with a high school athletes performance. Um, to give this a little bit of setup, this is Missy Hyman. Uh, Bob Gillett, well, he did um, was her coach, and he did probably some of the most re the most extensive research on dolphin kick. We're going to get into that a little bit later. We are going to start with this. This is in high school. Uh, this is a national high school record at the time. Um, this is the 100 butterfly at the Arizona, Arizona High School State Meet. And again, we're going to start with some real-time video that might be a little bit glitchy, uh, but we'll get better as we go. But we thought this is a great place to begin. Austin, you want to commentate? Um, yeah, sure. I mean, this is especially hits home to me because all of my high school state meets as an athlete were at this pool. Um, but this is this first wall is incredible. Take a look. One butterfly stroke on the first 25. So obviously this was prior to the change of the 15 meter rule, um, which makes it like a particular exciting moment in time where underwater kick was really just like uh, blasting off. Um, I don't know if you could see it's kind of getting a little glitchy, but um, there were she took four cycles on that second uh, wall, and I think she takes four cycles on the second two walls as well. So that's a total of 13 strokes of butterfly, uh, which is pretty amazing. And I think she posts something 52.4 here, I think. Is that right? It's going to show us. Yeah, 52.41. So just a little follow up on that particular um, athlete is um, a long course swim. And we're going to take a step back in time here in just a second uh, and show you where everything began. But we, we really did want to start with, uh, with, with Misty and with Gillett just to pay tribute because he really did the most research. Uh, this is an underwater uh, 100 fly. You're gonna, they're going to pan out here in just a second, and you're going to see how long she's actually underwater. This is a long course pool. Now, look at the last couple kicks is really where she takes off in the last six, seven, eight kicks. Um, but that's about a 35, 38 meter kick out. Um, then we got a little slow-mo of her foil movement. Notice she's pretty much on her side um, through this motion. Really high degree of undulation. Um, really, really special underwater. So we want to, we just wanted to start there. We're going to go back in just a second to the first person that really created, um, underwater dolphin kick, which is David Burkoff and the Burkoff blast off. And he, you guys, some of you guys might actually know him or have seen him on deck, his daughter, Catherine. Uh, I think is headed to Stanford and uh, he coaches in our section or has coached in our section. So this is very dated. This is 1988 and um, notice Rowdy's not an announcer yet. Oh, I like um, the dude's mustache. <laughs> yeah, John, John Neighbor. John Neighbor held the world record all through the 70s in, in, in the backstroke. So just kind of moving ahead, this is um, some really uh, uh, very, very rare footage of underwater swimming. This is just him warming up, if, if you take a note here. Just kicking out, you know, 35, 40 meters of warm up for kick, you know, just loosening up the dolphin kick. Um, but basically, he, he's the one that created the idea of staying underwater longer. And this is about as high tech as you could get in 1988. Um, he actually has pretty nice, pretty nice movement. Um, 
with the knees above the body line. We're going to talk about some of the technique of dolphin kick, but this is um, this he was way ahead of his time. He went to Harvard. He was incredibly smart. Uh, go ahead, go ahead. I'm able to bring it back to that diagram. I thought that was really cool, and maybe pause it there with the line in the middle, and then yeah. I think it's it's really nice that you see that center line, but then around that center line, you're seeing the fluctuation of the front kick and back kick. Yep. So, not he, Dave Burkoff is not a big guy. Um, this is back in the day when you could dive in, and you could swim out and swim back in. Catherine, please mute. Um, you could dive out, swim out, swim back in. It was all kinds of different rules back in the day. You'll also take note of the turn because they had to touch the wall when we get to the turn in this race. This was called the Burkoff Blast Off. Fourteen strokes on the first lap, and again the turn, not as far off the wall. Um, probably a twelve to fifteen coming off of uh, almost a forty meter kick out. Now again, this is nineteen eighty eight. He's in a brief, and uh, he's like fifty four mid here for a new world record. So that's a little bit of the history of dolphin kick and kind of where it started. And we think it's important to take this opportunity to do some education along the way as well. We are going to dive into some of the math behind why dolphin kicking is um, as effective as, as it is. And so uh, the first thing we're going to talk about is the foil movement. Uh, now. Look, this is, this is directly from Bob Gillett, uh, who is Misty Hyman's coach, the first athlete that we showed. Um, he studied the way that fish move through the water and how they propelled themselves. And this is just some diagrams from um, some literature that he shared with our staff when he did a mentorship visit in 2014. Um, but really just talking about uh, the vortexes that came off of the off the end of the kick now in his research he did all kinds of tests he actually had misty hyman hold a can of dye above her head and kick on her side and you're going to see another one of his athletes kicking on their side so that he could look at these vortexes and his theory he really believed strongly in kicking on your side because the vortexes didn't hit the bottom of the pool um, in a very deep pool it doesn't matter but in most pools uh, dolphin kicking, these vortexes are not going to complete themselves. They're going to they're gonna bounce off the bottom of the pool and get disrupted. So he was a real big proponent of kicking on your side or on a slant to prevent that because there was no, no chance of losing the vortexes, but getting, no, no chance of it getting disrupted. So some of the, probably the best place for us to start is um, just giving credit where credit's due. And then talking about the things that we have you that we use in our program. And again, this is still from Bob Gillett, but a lot of the things we're going to talk about in this presentation have to do with the snap, keeping the knees in front of your body line, knee locked on your back kick, not extending the kick behind very far behind the body line. This is a little more individual as to whether or not you move the upper body or the rib cage, but pretty much everyone moves their rib cage. Really good thoracic flexibility. Some of them you will see moving all the way through their wrists and their fingertips. That's very individual. And then high rate. So this is something that we use in practice all the time. Now, Gillett would never talk about dolphin kicking about trying unless he tried to explain to you why it was faster. 
So like we talked about last week, tempo times cycles or stroke rate times stroke length is what creates swimming speed. So for you to understand the dolphin kick equation, you need to understand that two dolphin, we're gonna talk about just butterfly for, for, for the sake of simplicity. Two dolphin kicks equals roughly the same distance traveled as one cycle of butterfly on the surface, okay? Dolphin kick, we talk about the rate of dolphin kick all the time. Uh, dolphin kick can be, be performed at that efficiency at a 0.45 rate. So two dolphin kicks is done at a 0.9 rate. Elite level butterflyers usually perform butterfly on the surface at a 1.0 to 1.1 rate. So when you look at the math equation, um, if you take athlete A does five dolphin kick surfaces and then starts swimming butterfly, athlete B stays underwater for 11 dolphin kicks. The differential is going to happen between the athlete who stays underwater kicking at this 0.9 per two dolphin kick rate for six dolphin kicks while the person on the surface swims three cycles. So three cycles at a 1.05 rate is going to take 3.15 seconds. Six dolphin kicks or three cycles of dolphin kick at a 0.9 rate, okay, or six times 0.45 is going to take 2.7 seconds. That equals 0.45 faster during that time period where an athlete stays underwater all the way to 15. Now, granted, this is assuming that somebody's very efficient and that they're maintaining that kick rate. For those of you that have used tempo trainers, you know how hard the 0.45 kick rate is. So this advantage shrinks if your rate slows. Does anybody have any questions on the math equation here? Well, I've got it up because I'm gonna move on to more video. Okay, all right, great. So um, I would say that in the modern era, Ian Crocker had a profound impact um, on dolphin kick. Now this first one's at real time and I know it's gonna be a little glitchy. We've got, we're gonna slow it down here right away. His knee flexibility and ankle movement is exceptional. And you can watch the ankles almost like, look like they're so loose that the, there's fins on the end of his feet. Um, he was world-class in both butterfly and freestyle and dolphin kick was a major part. Um, I'm gonna freeze frame here in just a couple minutes to talk about the things that we just talked about with, uh, with it, both his flexibility and our rotate the focus uh, key points. So when we talk about knee in front of your body line, this is what we're talking about, okay? Basically, he's not, he's a little behind his hip line and his, and his body line, but his knees are underneath him to, do, to start the kick. When we talk about the snap, this is what the snap is. He is delivering excellent, a tremendous force through his quads into a fully extended knee position. This is the most important part of, of the kick and why it's always first and rotate the focus. Now the next piece is keeping your knee locked on the back kick. And I slowed this down as much as I could to really articulate keep what it looks like to keep your knee locked on the back kick. So when you think about rotate the focus, this, these, these are some of the, the key points that we're talking about in this process. And as you watch these other athletes rotate through, you're gonna see and, and I'm going to immediately go to somebody uh, to a drill that has a lot more uh, upper body undulation, but you're going to see that um, they pretty much all adhere to this. Now, look, this is a drill. This is not what she looks like when she goes fast, but this is a great place to start. This is Cindy Tran. She was um, 50 point low, 100 back. Uh, primarily underwater dolphin kicker. And this is on her side, starting with a very slow motion progression. And I know you're getting like frame by frame, frame by frame a little bit, and it's going to get a little glitchy as she starts to go faster. But I think this is a really nice articulation of how Gillett would have taught dolphin kick because this is his last like kind of world-class athlete. Um, 
So you see the upper body starting to tighten up. The undulation in her feet is still very great. And then the last one here is gonna be a high rate dolphin kick. I'm gonna give you some key points there. Nice snap way out in front of the body frame. Really good, very similar key point, right? When we talk about knee in front of your body line, that is an awesome shot of what you should really be looking for to deliver the most force on the water. Um, that's about as far as she goes behind her body line. And then she goes right into the knee flex and into the delivery on the snap. So um, really clear image, really nice shot of watching a uh, dolphin kick on your side. So now we're gonna go to a little bit bigger names and some things that um, are probably a little more impressive. So this is a underwater 23-4 long course 50 backstroke kick. And there's gonna be some slow-mo at the end of it. Uh, but this is Ryan Lochte, I think 2009. Um, and I know this little glitchy. I'm going to, it's going to come right back and you're going to be able to watch it. But 23 4 underwater dolphin kick in a training suit um, it just shows the potential of speed that the underwater, you know, the underwater environment provides. So it's going to come back and we're going to be able to look at his technique just a little bit more kind of look at some of the similarities. He's got a little bit of upper body movement, really great flexion in his rib cage. And again, great ankle flexibility. Just look at his ankles and look how fluidly they move with the water. Really nice flexion from into the toes. So I'm gonna give you a contrast now with Lochte from on his stomach. And we're gonna to start to talk about the differential between what it looks like to kick on your back and what it looks like to kick on your stomach. Um, here, there's not nearly as much flexion in his upper body. You can see he's getting a really nice angle with his knees getting below his body line. This is harder on your stomach than it is on your back. And when Allison and Austin and I were talking about this earlier today, we thought it was pretty important to explain, the difference in your buoyancy is what generates that, that challenge. Um, it's a more natural thing to stay underwater for an extended period of time when you're on your back than when, on your, when you're on your stomach. Getting this without diving your hands down and maintaining this kind of a set, clean line on your ascension is actually pretty challenging. Um, and we're gonna look at a couple of athletes coming up with, um, I'm gonna compare the same athlete on their stomach and on their back so that you can kind of see, um, you can see the differential. So this is Whitney Myers. We saw her start last time. And you'll notice on the bottom, a little bit higher degree of knee flexion. Her knee is a little bit further in front of her body even though her form is great on her stomach. Just a little bit more easily producing um, what we're after and, and, and that, that really highly propulsive uh, movement on her back. Does anybody have questions looking at this? We, we did have one question that came up that I thought was really good is, um, and I think we've been tying all these conversations and what can we do on land to help this skip? I have a couple in mind. Sean, do you have some exercises in mind that can really benefit the underwater skill on land? Well, I, I'm going to give you a couple. Just, just looking at her and then thinking what, back to what you just saw with Lochte. Look at their movement in her rib cage and in her abs. Okay, and, and I know that that's, this is like a, and I'm gonna go back, I'm gonna go back to Lochte right now um, on the underwater. I want you to think about um, the spinal mobility that is, is associated with this kind of flexion. 
something as basic as cats and cows is going to give you really uh, a heightened awareness of what your rib cage is capable of doing and the way that you're capable of moving. Um, obviously, there's a lot of ab work that goes into transferring that energy and force through from up above down through your core and into your legs. So I, I would start there. And then Austin, why don't you pick it up from, from there? Sure, yeah, I have a couple in mind. I think simple like laying on your back and doing uh, leg raises. And you can even go into a leg raise where it's a, a knee first and then an extension off top that would mimic the uh, actual dolphin kick underwater. I think that would really help with the core, the core strength, that aspect. And I think that the one that I, I really love the most is uh, hanging on a pull-up bar going into a knee raise and then a full leg extension up top. And Sean, you talked a little bit about the opening of the rib cage. What I think is really unique on the, on the pull-up bar, when you're hanging, naturally your rib cage does open up. So you're in a little bit of that, that type of position. Um, and then having both the core strength and leg strength to be able to bring your knees to your chest and then have a full leg extension perpendicular with your body requires a lot of strength and I think is really valuable and, and translates well. So I just did a, while we were talking about that, just a little review so you could see the variety of movement. Now look, this next video just was, was a happenstance and it's actually a one, one of our own athletes and we were doing underwater dolphin kick uh, at the end of practice and she's actually on her back and, but the reflection that's right here is from her on her stomach. So just think about what you just saw of people on their back. And, and it, those of you that have seen your own video, how challenging it is to replicate that on their stomach. So you can see this, this is not, if, if somebody looked like this on their stomach, they would be getting a really great knee bend. And similar to some of the things that we just saw, um, this is actually harder to achieve on your stomach than it is on your back. I just thought this was a really uh, unique capture. I mean, I've been coaching a long time and I don't know that I've ever seen something like this come up, but um, Jenna has great form on her back dolphin kick. I just thought, what, what if it looked exactly the same on her stomach as it did on her back? Um, so I don't think any underwater video session would be complete without some Phelps video. So uh, this is just, it's one loop of him on his stomach and um, I just watch it for a little bit. You can see the rib cage movement, little bit of movement in his hands, great, great flexion in his knees, um, really excellent finish uh, on the kick, really great snap. And he does an awesome job from the lower half of his body, keeping his knee underneath his body nine, not letting his feet get way up behind him, but instead staying in a more powerful zone underneath his body. Um, he won a lot of races this way um, and probably was one of the most explosive humans underwater that we've ever seen until we got to Dressel. And we're going to wrap up Dolphin Kick on a uh on a caleb dressel montage which i think both is going to be a great lead in into underwater pullouts because we've actually got some video of him doing underwater pullouts and winning there as well um before i get into that uh does anybody have questions okay all right so this is dressel some of it's going to happen at real time and some of it's going to be slow-mo. It's, it's going to have some repeats in it. So bear with the real-time ones. Um, but you can see a little movement in his hands. A little slower this time. Just really graceful and natural from toe all the way through his fingertips. This is a breaststroke pullout. Um, Allison, what'd you say? He broke the American record at SECs and then didn't swim the event at NCAAs? Yeah, he 
went like 50.0 uh swam off events like was this 2000 or i'm trying 18. to remember. 18 the, yeah the same year as the 200 am video that we showed when he went 138.1 in the 200 am just like one of the most competitive meets uh collegiately wins breaks the american record and then doesn't even swim it at ncaa's And really nice head position on his breakout. Some of the breaststrokers tend to have a little higher head position. I thought his were exceptional. So from just a lot of different angles here, um, really, really tight streamline, great head position within his streamline. Um, dolphin kick, he dolphin kicks right into his breakout, something that we talked about a little bit a um, couple weeks ago. Very similar to the way Phelps would break out that the last dolphin kick fits right into the first stroke of freestyle. And I think this is the last one. It'll loop a couple times. It's a butterfly breakout. Coming off the turn. All right. So um, his efficiency, one of the things you can see in the knee bend here, he gets so much power out of every kick. Um, he actually does fewer kicks than most of his competitors, kicks at a little bit slower rate. Um, and I think that's probably vexatious to some other people. Uh, so uh, any questions on dolphin kick? Because we're going to move into pullouts. All right, um, so we're going to start with just, um, this is uh, actually Clark Burkle, and this is Kitajima, just a little comparison, just as a starting point. Um, I'm going to slow them both down. So dolphin kick, really nicely connected. He's got a little, little arch in his back, not quite as flat. When you look at Kitajima's line, you're going to see totally flat and that and look at his hands totally flat very meticulous um for those of you who do not know who kosuke kitajima is he was world record holder in the 100 and the 200 breaststroke for quite some time um he is especially detail oriented um was pretty much always won his turns and starts and breakouts, like all the details, very much a, a technician of the stroke. Um, but you can see his dolphin kick in contrast to what some of the other things we see. It's a little bit further behind him. I think um, he, he allowed his heels up a little bit higher behind his body frame, but the line and the meticulous nature of the way he brings his hands forward and really tries to lower his resistance is something that you're gonna see in videos that we show a little bit later. Um, look at the shoulder scrunch right here. Okay, we're gonna show this one a couple times. Look at how hard this athlete is working to minimize his resistance in his shoulders. He's squeezing them into his neck, uh, right into the lower jaw on the release of uh, the pole. Very tight with his hand positioning on the bottom of, his, uh, on the, bottom of the pull out trying to lower resistance on his hands on the way forward. This is another video of Kitajima in the middle of a 200 breaststroke. So in a race situation, um, under stress, midway through, I think this is either at the 100 or at the 150 of a 200 breaststroke. Great line on his push off, rotates to flat. Sean, can you talk a little bit about how well these guys are doing and controlling their line through the dolphin kick and how some people tend to bury their head in that moment? Yeah, so there is a big tendency to, um, to bend at the waist. In, and I think that a lot of I, I, our own athletes have seen it. Um, 
really lose control of the dolphin kick and ended up, they feel like they're producing a lot of force, but in fact, they're incurring so much resistance with the loss of their line that um, they're not really, in, in fact, gaining as much as they feel like they are. And I think you're going to see with uh, Lily King, uh, she's going to provide a pretty good example of someone who has um, minimized her dolphin kick. And I think we'll even see it a little bit more off the turn. But um, I feel like that is an effort to stay very compact, not try to overdo the kick, and just create a dolphin kick that's propulsive, but not something that's going to cause her to lose her line of advancement. Um, so I think that I think it's something that is individual. If you struggle with that and tend to bend at the waist, and I think you're going to see it more right here off the turn. I mean, this is her going 104 along course on her breast. And that's, that's the dolphin kick that was delivered off of, off of the turn. It's not that big of a kick. It's very compact. Her whole goal is to maintain her push-off speed, get through the pullout, maintain momentum, and get into the, the breaststroke swimming. So I think that um, for some people, you're going to find that, that this is a more effective strategy than really just trying to wail on the dolphin kick. Does so anybody have questions on this? Um, Sean, I have a question. Yeah. What, I guess, how long should you wait after you push up the wall to start your dolphin kick? Oh, well, that's actually a great question. I mean, if you, if you, I don't have these at real time, but um, for the most part, the, the, that distance between the wall and the pullout should be the majority of your advancement. Once you break the streamline, and I'm gonna answer this kind of in two ways. Once you break the streamline, you should be at an already predetermined depth and the pullout should carry you towards the surface and the kick should be done very shallow. So there's like probably 60 to 70% of the ground that you cover is going to be done before you even break the pull. Now, with a really long pull or in a 200 breaststroke, where you're trying to extend that, you may lengthen it a little bit versus in 100 where you're just trying to hit the, hit the surface with as much momentum as possible. Um, but Claire, the real answer probably comes in how good are you at pushing off the wall? Think back to the Kevin Cordes video that we showed of the 200 breaststroke and how good he was on his push-offs and how long he was able to hold that streamline effectively and still be winning. So I think that the, some of the answer comes in, how good are you when you push off the wall? When you look at these different, I'm gonna go back through these just real quick. Look at the angle of the line of their push off. He's got his feet almost steering him. He held it. He's not at his side for very long. I mean, in, in context, this motion right here is carrying him. I mean, he's, he's past the flags. This is not a long hold. He barely hits the bottom and stays there for any length. I mean, that's a, granted, we're at 20% speed. But proportionally, it's a very, very short movement um, after, the, after the pullout and before the kick. Is that, I'm going to show you King just in context one more time. That's a start. I think Let's that's a good question. And wouldn't you say that, um, that would apply to underwater dolphin kicking as well, and really any push off. Like, when is that moment that you transition into the dolphin kick, or you transition into, um, yeah, your underwater pullouts? And I think, yeah, it probably depends on person to person, and definitely a skill that that you want to internalize and focus on on your push offs. I think, Claire, what you look at is the proportions, because they're pretty similar. Of the majority of the distance happens before they break the streamline. That's like 60 to 70%. And then after that, it should be pretty pre-scripted depth progression from the underwater, from the pullout to the underwater kick to the first, to the first stroke. Um, so we're going to finish with Adam Petey on this. And I want to 
um, just draw attention to stuff like this. Like the way that he brings his hands up, he's trying to disguise, you know, use one hand to kind of shield the other um, as he goes through. This, this, put in context, this kind of detail is regularly missed. But look, he's flat handed. He's trying to create a scenario where he's incurring as little resistance as possible with his hand movement forward and sneak his hands forward in a, in a relatively streamlined way. I don't know that a lot of um, even very high level performance athletes are missing this kind of a detail. And maybe it's not exactly like this when he's in a race, but I think it's pretty clear that this is a goal of his to be able to perform with that kind of detail. So this is, this is PD going, breaking world record. Um, and he's not quite as clean with his hands there. But a lot of the other details, again, just looking at this flat hand detail that you saw in Kitajima. How many of you actually think about holding that position that exquisitely? Or in Kitajima, you saw him pointing his toes and being as streamlined as possible. Like, look how, I mean, think about plank series. If you can't hold a plank flat, you're not going to achieve this position moving through the water. So I went back to the dry land of like holding your plank for 30 seconds and being in a perfect line. That's something that directly relates to how well you can execute this kind of a movement in, a, in an aqueous, you know, environment. This is a turn. The timing of the connection is pretty uniform in the examples that I've shown in that they're gonna, they're pretty much gonna push. You can see them set up the dolphin kick right into the catch and there's a connection between the momentum of the dolphin kick and the top of the pullout. Um, that's pretty, pretty, um, that's pretty uniform. And then the other thing that I would say that I really want to draw attention to, and I'm a pretty big believer in, is that I want you to notice how shallow he is off the in from this underwater kick to the first stroke. Look at where he's at. Kick, stretch, and then he breaks the surface. I'll let you watch it off the turn. Okay, and I know this is uh, we'll come back and watch it at slow-mo. He's gonna kick, stretch, and break the surface. And that's probably something I should have emphasized on King as well is that they are right into the first stroke. And I'm gonna go back actually while I've got this, I've got that um, topic at the forefront. They are coming at this in a way that they do not want to be caught gliding off of the underwater kick. Once they kick, they're basically starting their swim. And I know I clipped it so it wouldn't go um, into the above water view because I found it to be disruptive when I watched it back but they are going right into that first stroke. I'll show you hers off the turn as well. You can see her at the back of her head grazing the surface of the water. By the time that her feet are closing on the kick, she's already pretty much almost emerging into the next stroke. Very nice hand placement for her. Kick, stretch, heads broken the surface, right into the catch. That's actually a really, really nice shot of it right there. All right. Anybody have any other questions? We are going to move through the um, three other strokes in the next three weeks successively. So I don't know what order we're going to go in, but butterfly backstroke and breaststroke. Anna, are you asking a question or are you just? Uh... No, I'm kind of doing hand movements um, based on the strokes. Okay. So. All right. All right. Yep. <laughs> Good year. I couldn't tell if that was a hand raised. Yeah. All right. Anybody else? Okay. You guys have a great day. Um, take care. And that's uh, Technique Talk for Wednesday. See ya. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.